Um, thanks for coming. I'm uh, delighted that uh, we got more people than signed up. Uh, I was getting kind of worried about those that signed up. Uh, let me start. This is going to be the only thing I read from these notes, but let me, let me start by reading this first paragraph. So, uh, I think it says something about uh, what we perceive to be our style. Too many people merely do what they are told to do. The greatest satisfaction derives from the realization of your individual potential. Perceiving something in your own way and expressing it through adequate understanding of your tools. Take advantage of everything. Be, dom nominate, be dominated by nothing except your own convictions. It's a quote from the introduction to the camera by Ansel Adams. I think he probably knows what he's talking about. <laughs> so, at any rate, uh, let's try to go from here. A lot of what I'm going to suggest is, are, are simply that. They're suggestions. Uh, and it's, it's up to you to kind of sort out what you like and, and what you want to put into effect and, and uh, that, that sort of thing. So uh, we'll start with, with a little uh, proposition on what is certain things uh, for, the, for the ones of us who are uh, beginners or close to it. Uh, does everybody know what resolution means? Okay. All right, so I don't have to read that one or, or talk about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, uh, resolution specifically is how many pixels the camera sensor has. Your camera is capable of X number of pixels. 16 meg, 20 meg, 21 meg, 28 meg, whatever that number is. Uh, and uh, that, in point of fact, whatever that number is, when you put that into your computer, uh, that number gets multiplied by three to fill up a red, a green, and a blue channel. So that's where you get your 12 meg camera producing a 36 meg file when you get to the, to the uh, computer, okay? <clears throat> and the primary reason to buy a camera with lots of megs is because you get with that, if, if, if no other reason, you get with that a greater number of colors uh, and a, a greater nuance in the use of color simply by having greater resolution. Okay, so that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, but once you've bought your camera, once you've decided about that, that kind of goes away. We know that JPEGs are going to be small resolution and we know that when you go to print, a print uh, you're going to get uh, greater resolution out of that. Uh, and. Uh, it's pretty well cut and dried thereafter. So, the other thing I want to talk about in, along these lines is exposure. And I think a lot of us have problems with exposure <coughs> coming into the, to the group when you get off of automatic. How many of us are shooting pictures in automatic only? Shame. <laughs> Shame. Okay. All right. We're going to try to get you off of automatic tonight. Okay. All right. Uh, the three, three uh, tiers of, or three, how do I call this? ISO, aperture, and shutter speed make up exposure. ISO, International Standards Organization, 
back when I started with, with uh, black and white film in the 1970s, it was ASA, American Standards. Uh, and, uh, but it's the same thing. It is the, the sensitivity of your digital chip, of, of your, uh, what's the term? Sensor. Uh, so, <coughs> I personally shoot at 200. There are lots of higher uh, uh, ISOs, greater speed, and greater sensitivity. Uh, I don't see any any uh, problem with my own work as far as the quality of the, of the image is concerned. I, and I don't see the need to get much faster than 200. Now starting out the day, it's dark, so 200 may not be where you want to start uh, with ISO. You may want to rack it up to about 800. Uh, which is what I select. Uh, you might want to wreck it more than that. A lot of people shoot higher than I do, and I, I'm not, you know, I just don't feel the need to shoot higher and higher ISOs. I'll rack it up to 800 when it gets almost dark or in the afternoon or when it's just cracking first light in the morning. And then I'll, sh if I think about it, sometimes I don't. Uh, I will shift down to uh, 400 uh, pretty shortly thereafter uh, when we've got more light. Uh, and then thereafter I'll go ahead and put it into 200 and that'll, that'll be my main uh, setting for the day. By the way, questions are welcomed. We welcome your questions with enthusiasm, as they say. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of going higher? Well, the, uh, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> uh, the advantage is, is that you get more light. The higher the ISO number, uh, the, the greater the, the sensitivity, therefore more light. Okay, so you can, you have some latitude in how you want to shoot there. If you want a high, uh, a, a small aperture, blah, 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 you can do it easier that way, okay? The, the downside is that the greater the ISO number, the higher the noise level, so that you walk back in and you say, that was a great shot I took today of that beautiful blue sky. What are those damn dots doing in the middle of it? <laughs> so you got that to deal with, okay? If you stay in the low numbers, you won't have a problem with noise. So you won't have the, the digital noise to worry about. There are programs that you can use. Uh, an old one that I've still got and, and use from time to time is called Noise Ninja. Uh, works as good as anything still. Uh, and you know, there's a couple more. I think there's some in Photoshop and in Lightroom both. Uh, am I right? Yes. In Photoshop. Uh, that you can use, and I assume that they're reasonably uh, uh, effective. So, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, an alternative to, to raising your ISO would be to have a slower shutter speed. Sure. So, which is the worst for noise, going up on the ISO or going really, really <coughs> slow on the I'm, I'm not aware of, of uh, the slower shutter speed ever being a problem with noise. Like um, 30 <coughs> seconds or a minute or two minutes? Well, now you get that far, you might, there might be. I, I haven't been there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it will create noise. But, yeah, at 30 seconds I would assume it would, but, you know. It, it, so it's kind of a trade-off, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but realize how high you would worse. have the ISO to, to, to for 30 seconds to be an alternative. Uh, it it's, would be quite great, you know. We could sit here and figure it out, but uh, mm -hmm. yes, sir. But you can refer to your camera manual or reviews or do a test to see at what yes. ISO noise starts showing up in your particular camera. Yes, you can. The older ones, 400 was noisy, and now you can go way above that. Exactly. Exactly. Ken's right. 
Okay. Okay. Um, the ISO numbers uh, are, are full stops. 200, 400, 800, 1600, and so forth. Those are all full stops. Most of your cameras will have one third stops in between those. Uh, I use in aperture and shutter speeds, I use half stops. So to think in third stops just blows my mind. I can't do it. Oh my gosh. So I don't raise except in full stops, raise or lower in ISO except in full stops. And it doesn't seem to be that big a deal. So forget your third stops in ISO and just go with, go with, uh, go with a full stop. Okay. And we got, we got, we talked about noise. Uh, we talked about the third stops. Okay, aperture. Uh, has anybody got a lens that has F1.0 on it? They make them. <clears throat> Once upon a time. I, I, the only thing I figured out is that Leica, years and years ago, put out an F1.0 50 millimeter lens and did so for a few years and then didn't anymore. And whether it was, was uh, successful in the marketplace, I, I don't have any idea. And then Canon put out a, uh, a 1.0. They had a 0.95, I think. <coughs> Pardon? I think Canon had a, a 0.95 at one time. Well, they may have a, a 1.9, but they also had a 1.0. 0.95. Oh, 0 0.95. Yeah, it was oh, bigger than know. one. Depth the field is an eyelash, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. But it helps me in the progression of exposures, in the progression uh, of stops, apertures, to remember that I start with F1.0. Look at your, at your notes, the list of full stops. 1.0, 1 1.4, uh, 2.0, 2.8. What's the relationship between those? 2.0 is double 1.0, okay? 2.8 is double 1.4. And that's true throughout the scale. Every other number doubles. Okay, these are full stops, okay? F1, 1 1.42, 4, 5, 6, and so forth. Those are all full stops. And you can, once you work with that system for a little bit, and you know you can count, you know, your mama did taught you that a long time ago. You should be able to do things in your head that, you, that you're not cognizant of when you're working with uh, exposure. Okay, you can get there faster. Uh, and everybody knows, I hope, that the smaller the F number, uh, the larger the opening in the lens. Everybody's aware of that. Okay. Um, here's my half stops. We go, we go through all of those. And. Uh, nothing new in there. The smaller the aperture, the greater the depth of field. Uh, if you're shooting landscapes, you want to think in terms of F16 or, or uh, smaller. Uh, if you're doing uh, a nice portrait, uh, outdoor portrait, uh, F4 or larger will get you the depth of field that, and, and uh, are not the depth of field that you might wish to have, okay? And that's a very important tool. You, you gotta think about what my depth of field, what am I shooting and what kind of depth of field do I need to have? Uh, 
before it dawns on you to think about, well, you know, maybe I ought to look at that. Okay. Uh, and I've already noted that we, we double our fund when we do F1, F14, so forth. Um, shutter speeds. Boy, there's 100,000 shutter speeds down there. Uh, these are all half stops. Uh, and uh, I think the next paragraph indicates that uh, a lot of those uh, shutter speeds, uh, well, all of them, should be you should have placed your camera on a tripod okay that you can't hold uh, a lot of the, <coughs> uh, the settings that you will be using unless you are on a tripod mr spencer right here says that he has three things that will improve your photography shoot from a tripod shoot from a tripod shoot from a truck and it's true mm -hmm. he speaks not with fork and tongue sorry am i getting out of the image i'm, I'm roaming again <clears throat> okay I, I don't shoot less than about 125th uh, I'm, I'm sure that's probably conservative but there you go Now, who knows the Sunny 16 rule? One, two, three, four, it's five. Okay. 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 Sunny 16. Uh, this you can you can set your exposure without uh, without uh, a meter if you do this uh, on a sunny day. Okay. Hence the sunny. Set your shutter speed to the closest number that you have set the ISO to. So if you're shooting ISO 200, set your aperture at sunny 16, and set your shutter speed at 180th, or the closest thing you have on your camera to 200. Works every time. you can then manipulate that uh, if you want more depth of field than 16 you can go ahead and rack 16 up to 32 and then pull down your your uh, aperture i mean uh, your shutter speed so you can offset one way to get something else okay everybody with me on that okay all right. You haven't looked at a meter yet. You know, you're still working out of your head. All right. Uh, and then continuing the, 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 the kind of uh, equivalent thing, if it's not sunny 16 and it's a, it's, it's a somewhat overcast sky, just give yourself one more stop worth of exposure. Do sunny 16, but just give yourself another uh, another stop open. If it's an overcast, if, if it's really an overcast sky, give you one or uh, two or three more stops. You know, and the joy of digital photography is that you can look on the back of your camera, and you can't tell a whole lot about that image, but you can tell whether it's over overexposed or underexposed, to a degree. To a degree, you can. And that, that's the fun of that statement at the start of this thing, that we do have the opportunity without an expenditure of a lot of money, after we get the camera to begin with, uh, <laughs> that we can experiment. We can, we can do all of this and, and uh, without the idea that we're going to bring home a world-shattering uh, photograph, uh, but we'll bring home some extra knowledge when we go. Okay. 
Uh, now that we know something about exposure, does everybody know what middle gray is? Hands for middle gray? <coughs> Okay. All right. You know. You know. Okay. All right. Everything. Really, okay. We we got got a few folks who know what middle gray is. Okay. Uh, everybody seen one of these before? There's middle gray on there. Okay. It's zone five, middle gray. So now that we know what it is, it's stuck between zones zero and Z and 10, right in the middle, okay? So your meter in your camera is charged with the responsibility of finding middle gray. It doesn't know what middle gray looks like, but it's charged with the responsibility of finding it. And most of the time, you have to think it does. But sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so, it, I'm gonna suggest a couple of things here that, that will further your knowledge uh, and give you greater latitude in how you work and what you do, okay? So, I'm very confused about what to expect from my camera, the meter built into my camera. Uh, and, and I will share my confusion with you so you can become confused. Uh, I don't know, on my histogram, for instance, when I'm looking at the histogram on the back of my camera, there are five zones in that histogram. Now, logic would, would indicate that that histogram is capable of showing ten zones, those. Uh, but things are not always logical, and maybe it's just supposed to show five zones, which I'm told is what most modern digital cameras are capable of. They're not capable of, shooting, of giving you a nine zone or a ten zone shot. They're capable of giving you five, maybe six, but mainly five. Uh, So, given the fact that, that your camera light meter is an extremely sophisticated piece, uh, it's still, I think, going to miss that exposure sometime or another. Uh, and sometimes quite frequently. Yes, ma'am? This may not be what you want to talk about in this class, but when I'm looking at that histogram, what do I want it to look like? I'm sorry, what now? When I'm looking at the histogram in the back of the, my camera, what do I want it to look like, or what am I looking for when I'm looking Well, at let's it? just jump on up and do that. Uh, <coughs> it's, it's on the next page, but okay. uh, next couple wait. of pages. But, uh, what, what I want to see is the map of, of what I shot, which is, which is how many pixels were at, at end zone Seven. How many pixels were in zone? Whatever. What's the what's the, the the breadth of the histogram itself? Is it over five zones or is it over ten zones? Or how do I read that? I still don't know how to read it over. But but what I think the camera folks want us to do is accept that that the histogram probably is not going to give you more than about six zones of information, five or six zones. Uh, so that if it, it, then it can then show you a nice histogram that goes from one side all the way to the other. And you say, oh man, I got it all. 
well, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but I, I, you know, I think that that may be what we're talking about. So you're saying it's going to be like shorter than your whole visual picture that you're shooting? Well, what it's I, I'm, what I'm saying is confusing, and I admit to that because if if the the actual histogram went off the histogram graph it would be stacked up against that side so you would see oh hey it's stacked up over here there's something out there and that's not always the case that's not always the case but i i think what you know it's a lot easier to use this on black and whites obviously than it is on on anything else or and certainly and it's a lot easier to do on prints, but I think we need to be looking at, at the final result uh, and trying to make some uh, determination. Yes, ma'am. I think if I was looking at that just from a color perspective and I had five instead of two, I would probably use two of those to each one. So my darkest dark would be instead of level one and level two, it, you know, it would be just level one. Well, that's and what I thought. The lightest light would be nine and ten and five. So that's what I would think. In, in preparation for this, I played around with, with the, the histogram quite a bit. Uh, and uh, I was getting anything that stayed inside or was stacked up only slightly uh, would, would not be more than about five or six but it's got I got different colors I'm going to use it uh, what has it got S uh, six Zones, or is it four? Minus five. Five zones. One, two. This isn't working out. <laughs> Divide each one in half. There you go. Like that. All right, we'll play those. Are, play like those are equal. Please. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, now I lost my complete train of thought. Uh, what I was getting with, with this was was something that looked like this, but it didn't it didn't have uh, it, it only had five or six zones or five zones if it looked like this on the back of the camera. This is a Canon camera. Nikon may be different. I don't know. So I said, okay, I don't really like that, but, but what can I do about it? I think I'll go get my gray card. We're going to talk about gray cards here in a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to shoot a picture of my gray card and see how the histogram does with it. The histogram took the gray card. The gray card was smacked up against the lens with, with good lighting on it. Uh, so it wasn't a question. It couldn't see anything but the gray card. Okay, the histogram looked like that. <laughs> and that's pretty close to where it ought to be and pretty close to what it ought to be because it only saw middle gray. Okay, so I know that, that worked for me. <clears throat> okay, but if you took the width of that and and extrapolated what you might have in the, the number of zones, you'd wind up having no more than five or six zones. What you're missing, Carrie, is that about 80% of what your camera sees is in the top 50% of that histogram. And, and we're, we're gonna talk about that too. Uh, and, and maybe that's the answer. It's not linear. Maybe, and, and, and you know, that's, uh, we're going to get to that under exposing to the right. Uh, Top half? No. No. This no, we're talking about this way. 
who we're talking about. But the bottom what what, what is Ken is, is saying is that in 12-bit uh, work, which our cameras, I, I guess all of our cameras are 12-bit when they're working this histogram, okay, then um, there's 4,000 and some odd colors available. 2,024 of them are right here. Uh, 1,012 are right here, you know, 506 are right here, and so on down the scale. Okay, and it doesn't, it doesn't last very long. Uh, that's in your notes, as a matter of fact, on page, uh, well, their pages are not numbered. The one that starts up, conventional wisdom is at the top, whatever that is. And down to uh, mid-page, it says exposed to the right. Okay, and the second paragraph is just what I was talking about. Uh, capable of recording up to 4096 distinct colors. Zone, and, and that's supposedly zone uh, nine, I guess. Uh, then the next one over would be uh, no, I'm sorry, 4096 is all, all of it. And then 2048 is one zone, uh, 1024, 512, 256, and zone five, right in the middle, has 128, 128. So, that doesn't fit everything we know uh, about, about this thing. and. There's, there's lots of reasons to think, or, or, or let me put it this way, we have been led to believe that this, this exposed to the right was such a good deal because we're going to pick up all these colors. But we're not going to pick up all those colors because those colors, the ones that fall out here, are not saturated anymore. Those colors are, are, are very, very light. You know. But if you're shooting in raw, you're shooting in raw. You want everything bumped right up against that right edge. Yes. Because then your shadows are not going to fall off. There'll be more detail in the shadows if you can move everything to the right. And when you process, all the information is there. That's a, what you've drawn there in the red line is yeah. actually a perfect histogram. Yeah. If you took a picture and you got that histogram in the red line, that means everything on the bright side was within what the camera can see. Everything on the dark side was within what the camera can see. So if whatever you're taking there, that tells you you've captured it all. So this is the whole point of what I'm, what I'm trying to, what I want you guys to get about looking at the histogram is, is just exactly this. If you see this and it's not border to border, but it's this shape, you've got a good image. Okay, and then you can move it by changing your exposure. This so. may be a premature question, but if you've taken a picture of sitting your blood through my camera, um, and you got a lot of that white flashing, like it, you got lightning striking behind the picture, um, is there anything you can do about that once you get home? <coughs> Once you get home and the light says you've burned out that part of the picture, yeah, okay. well, it stays burned out. Okay. You, you can't recoup something that, that doesn't want to appear like that. Okay, so I'm going to get just a bright white light there on, if I print it or right. email it. To and, and, in all likelihood, yeah, you're just, you're just going to get white, white. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You're going to get that color right there. Yeah, okay. Okay, and no detail. There wasn't any way to, to set up, we were visiting no. somebody in no. the nursing but home and you couldn't no. the say point, move. The, <laughs> you know? the, the What I hope you go home with is that when I saw that, I should have taken another picture and moved the histogram with, uh, with, with a, okay. uh, yeah, another I mean, exposure. My camera didn't know that. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
Yes, ma'am. So what happens if you're looking at the histogram and all of the all of the visuals are appearing to the right or appearing to the left heavily? What is that telling you? Well, you're not finding middle gray. It's not capturing it evenly. You have what more light, more color, or what? Well, it it kind of depends on on you know look at, at what you're shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be a great disparity in in that scene, mm -hmm. so that that's what you would expect. Okay. You know. So if I'm trying to capture something that may be of interest in the left, yeah. and something really mild yeah. to the right, it may be. Clear. Yes, sir. I'm dying to draw some histograms yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, please do. Please. Yeah. Well, go for it. Can I, can I draw a histogram? Well, please do. I think Come I can up. answer some of their questions. Come on up. No, you, you see where we're going. We're trying to make this into a real tool that we can use, and we're trying to get away from automatic exposures. Okay? Give them one that works. <laughs> I must be a woolly part of the board or something. I don't know. If you, if what you were saying, if you have a histogram that looks like this, we know that well, more it looks detail. Like that, and then on the on the bottom, it kind of just kind of it just kind of dribbled around. off. Yeah. We know that most of the detail you're going to capture is on this side of the histogram. This is the light, lots of important detail here. This is darker, you're not getting much detail. So if you've got, if you're taking a, a picture and you get this, depending on what this is, you might move this over, change the exposure, and move this over, knowing that you're gonna get a lot more detail up here when you process it home. Okay, so it's a good thing to have it to the left. It's a good thing to have it as far to the right without the right. without going out. <clears throat> Question over here. What are we increasing exposure to adding light to get it to move the histogram? You would increase exposure yeah. to move it to the right. Yeah. This is the light side. Okay. The left is the dark side. So it's good to have the peaks then. That's the the way you're doing. Well, is it level or yeah. the peaks? Yeah. The, the <laughs> peaks are not important. It, it, each one of these is a stack of pixels in a certain exposure range. So uh, yeah. you don't worry about the, the peaks, but where, where, the, where the curve is located. If you've got one that looks like this, you know that everything out here is going to be blown out. You're not going to get any detail there. At the same time, if you've got one that looks like this, you know that all this, there's no detail, it's just black, you've lost it. So ideally, you want something that's, that's, that covers all your bases. So what they're, what they're saying exposed to the right is, I'll just make three. Rather than, if you can get your histogram right over here, you've captured 80, 90% of all the detail you're ever going to capture here. Now, when you go home and print this, if you just say print, you're going to get a blown out picture. But if you're doing it processing in raw, when you process this in the raw, you can move this curve back, and what you'll find out, it doesn't move back to here. It actually moves back to something like this. So you're getting a lot more detail in, in the shadow area. And, and, exposed, and these histograms can be weird because I just got back from Big Ben where the light is real intense. And I had a mountain scene uh, with, with bright sky behind it. The, the mountain was in shadow. And my histogram looked like this. <laughs> what this told me was my mountain is exposed here. And there's nothing in between. Then it hits that bright sky. I know that's going to be white. It's, it was white when I'm looking at it, it's going to be a white when I process it. So in order to fix that, I would have changed my exposure so it looked like this, and let this go out here. We don't care that. We know we're not going to get any detail there. And so what I do is I, I set my meter, and these cameras, they look at all these different 
parts of the, of the scene, and they come up with an average. I set my meter to center the needle, or center the, whatever your camera says. Center it, I take an exposure, I look at the histogram, then I work from there. And I'll change my exposure to make the histogram look the way I want. And I've done this enough times where I know that my, that with the histogram, when my meter is set at uh, 0.7 stops overexposed. So I set my meter to read o to, to overexpose everything by two thirds of a stop. And my histograms come out looking pretty good. So regardless of what your meter says, take a picture, look at the histogram, and if you don't like the histogram, <coughs> change your exposure at the end. Mm -hmm. What's happening at the time peaks that are going up above the top of the histogram. It's, uh, that's just a limitation of, of the, uh, the histogram itself. There's more pixels there than it can count on that, in that particular stack. Okay, not, not to be particularly worried about. Yes, ma'am. If I'm shooting, you know, these were all shot in automatic mode, but I look through and the histogram is going up, but it's not going down on the right side. So what would I do to fix that? Depends on the picture. If you have them on the left-hand side, it's usually a dark picture. See what more light Yeah. They're going to be darker. Yeah. If they're on the right-hand side, they're going to be brighter pictures. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I my rule is if it's between if it's in the range, it's going to work out. Yeah. You can change it in Photoshop. If you're if you're going into camera raw. Right. Well, you no, know, if it's within the range, you're going oh, to oh, have okay, a problem. Okay, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so. Yeah. I want to make sure I understand. So, when I'm looking at this, if I notice that I'm going off on the right hand side, then I'm getting too much light. So, I want to either um, decrease my shutter speed or increase my aperture. Mm -hmm. Or is it the opposite? It's opposite. Okay. You're going to, well, Whatever you want to do, you'll yeah. make the lighter yeah. parts go. You, you, want, you want less light coming into your camera, that's what you want. Right, but if you're worried so much about the right-hand side and getting that correct, which sometimes you have to, remember that it changes the darker parts too. Okay. How many of you have in your in-camera uh, in meter, how many of you have a spot meter in, as part of that? Everybody. At least half of us. Not much more than that. It's right there. Here's a spot meter. It's hard to get that in that camera, too. I don't even know what one of those is. Okay, well, we're going to talk about that. Uh, spot meter is, is a wonderful tool. The camera, the, the, the spot meter that the higher end cameras have, and I'm told, covers a spot of three to five degrees, okay? Uh, and it does a pretty darn good job. A handheld spot meter meters one degree, so it's more precise. If there's an aid that has really helped me understand what little I know now, uh, it's been because of this device right here, the handheld, uh, because it really taught me where middle gray was, and it taught me how to how to recognize what middle gray is without any other help, uh, because this is going to tell me. All I got to do is say, "There's that that bush over there, 100 yards." Take a read, meter reading, and there's that over there. There's take a meter reading, uh, and this is going to show me the difference between those meter readings. I can, I can be able to get uh, a real good idea of, and particularly the classic case of, of, of the, for, for using a spot meter, handheld spot meter, is in a canyon where you've got deep shadows on one side and bright brights on the other side. And you got to know where those deep shadows are and how, you know, how bad are they? And you really need to know pretty precisely how bad they are. Uh, and 
Sometimes the camera meter lets you down in that. Spot meter never will. This this is so. I don't think solar garbage is made made anymore, is it, Ken? Solar garbage. I, so. I don't think so. This is available at K. Does everybody know about KEH as a source of supply? KEH.com is something you want to write down. Uh, KEH.com is is a vendor out of uh, a suburb of Atlanta. Uh, they sell almost all used equipment and they have a, a rating system for their equipment that is <coughs> very simple and they stand by it. If they say this is like new, everything that came in the box will be in the box, it'll be, that's the way you're gonna get it from them. They're, they're highly reputable people in my opinion. I've had no uh, problem with them at all. I say that to say that something like this at KEH costs about 60 to 70 bucks in, in good condition. You know, I don't buy their junk stuff, but, but they have junk stuff for sale. But, uh, good to, to better condition costs you about 60 bucks. Well worth the money after you've got your $500,000, $2,000 camera. You know, we can add some more stuff to it. Yes, ma'am. So if you're looking for metal gray and you don't have a spot meter, you're not using your camera, you're looking for the medium intensity of where the light is. Exactly. Okay. You, you know. So not too bright, not too shadowy, okay. but just where that perfect, perfect middle ground of color is. I what learned back in, in, uh, in the days when bef before digital, and, and I was shooting a particular Canon camera that, that had a spot meter in it. Uh, and all of a sudden it dawned on me that when I was outdoors and I was shooting uh, a lot that day, it dawned on me that that, that, that Bermuda grass out there was middle gray. And it, and it is, you know. And then I started testing other things, you know. And you'll see some of that in, in the, the uh, notes here when you when you take them home uh, that you so that you can you can learn you know I have every uh, no doubt at all in my mind that anyone can can learn by looking at the scene pretty much what's middle gray out of it and what's not you know I don't you're not going to get it perfect but you're going to get darn close Okay. Okay, we're hopping around a little bit. Let me see what I missed. I'm not sure that, that we missed much of anything, to be honest with you. We we pretty well put to uh, carry for the for the new people, explain to them all the possible combinations of shutter speed and aperture and why you would choose one over another. Well, and, and, and that's in here to some degree, but not very much. Uh, okay, anybody, anybody want to try that just for fun? Uh, if you had a landscape scene and you want maximum depth of field would you choose and, and you only had two uh aperture settings you know depth of field is is, is uh tantamount to aperture control by aperture so do you take the smallest aperture or the largest aperture the smallest aperture. The smallest aperture. Uh, so starting at F1. But so you start all the way at F1. No. That's what no. the Jews is helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me define what F1 is. F1 is the ratio of the of the of the of the, of the aperture to the or not the aperture, but the, 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 the diameter of the lens. To the focal length. To the focal length of the lens. So if, if you had an F1, 
on a 100 millimeter camera, the diameter of this thing up here would be 100 millimeters. Okay, F2 would be 50 millimeters. Half. Half. Yeah. So that's that's where that goes. Now, where were we? Where were we going originally? <laughs> okay. All right. So, yeah, F8 uh, would would have greater depth of field. F16 would be even greater. And okay. I don't, you know, I don't shoot landscapes a lot, but I would assume that that uh, most landscape artists don't want to do much anything less than F16. Am I am I pretty close to right? No one get below F11. You won't get below F11. Uh, 11 thing. or 8 it's not F so I mean, you get big depth of field, but it's more, it's, not as it's sharp. less sharp than if you stayed at F8 or F11. And then you can control that with well, hyperfocal, which we won't get into. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and, and there is something to that. You, you, we're not going to do it tonight, but you need to learn what hyperfocal distance is. Uh, and Can you define hyperfocal distance? Don't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> so then light from where to where is going to be predominantly in sharpness from, say, this spot to the wall. But if you were taking a, if you were taking a flower picture and yes. the wind was blowing like it always is, yes. you would try to choose something but something in the middle which would give you enough depth of field and the mm -hmm. shutter speed which would help stop the flower from blowing. Sure. That's, the con that's what the decisions you have to constantly be making. Yes. If you were yeah. shooting a rodeo with lots of action, you're going to want the fastest shutter speed you can. You have to keep thinking about what, the, what, what is the result of my choice of aperture and shutter speed. You know, do I need greater shutter speed? Is the wind blowing? On and on. Rather than camera tell me what I need to do next. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So the F stops, it's really like a fraction. So like of the one, it's one over one, and then the F64, it's one over 64. So the bigger mm -hmm. the number, it's actually a smaller aperture. Is that right? So yeah, that's, that's correct. correct. Okay. It's it, the, F, the aperture is actually a fraction, and you have to think of it as 1 over 64, 1 over 64. Okay. Is that right? Actually, so, don't think of it as fractions. Think of the bigger the number, the bigger the yeah. depth of field. Okay. That's but it's, it's a smaller it. aperture, actually, is that right? It's a smaller diameter, but it doesn't matter. If you remember that the bigger the number, the bigger 164, the you have more depth the of field. Okay. F8 is less. Yeah. Um, and I think someone here in here. Um, here we go. You can come up and look at this. Uh, and if we need to take a break, we'll take a break. But um, photosharp.com, F O T O S H A R P.com. This is a, an organization that, that uh, not an organization, it's a one man band. Uh, Robert McKay uh, uh, puts out a variety of aids to help you with exposure problems. And one of his aids, or several of his aids, have to do with hyperfocal distancing. Uh, and when you are doing landscapes, you gotta have help figuring the, the hyperfocal distance. So and what we're trying to do is get the maximum that we can out of uh, the camera with our, with our setting. And it requires a little, because, you know, from where you focus, there's some of it in focus in front of that point, and some of it in focus behind that point. And what you want is as much of that as you can get. And that's a, a, a calculation. If you want, um, we can cover that at the end. Pardon? We can cover that right at the end so that 
<coughs> won't confuse everybody right now. And if you have a, an iPhone, they have free apps that will tell you the distances. Just put in your shutter speed and your uh, lens, and it just tells you right there what it is. Gee. Maybe I ought to get an iPhone. Uh, I don't have the I can find it, but yeah. I've, I've got iPhone? one right on mine. Yeah. True D O F. It's T R U E and then capital D O F for true depth of field. And I'll pass my phone around if people want to see what that looks like. It has a sliding scale depending on what lens you're using. Can I make a call? Is that, can you make a call? Yeah. <laughs> if you want to just, well, like the commercial, just touch phones. That way. Yeah. <laughs> I got friends in China. Anybody wants to see it, let me know. You want to talk about, can we talk about that? So you, have, you plug in the your numbers that you're using and then it's going to give you yeah. the you Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. The only thing I've got to add, well, I was I was to this point, but uh, <clears throat> there's not called field tools. Just look that. Exposure handbook by a guy by the name of Chris Weston. <laughs> if you've been around photography for a while, you know the name Weston. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is available at uh, Amazon. Um, and if you go to one of the Amazon sellers, it's about ten bucks. If you if you pay Amazon for it, it's about twenty bucks, uh, or maybe it's fifteen. What do I say in here? I think, uh, yeah, twenty bucks. Uh, it's in your notes. You don't need to take any you notes. Know, so. But this is as good as as I've found about the, the subject of exposure and and how you can release yourself from the from the grasp of, of your camera who says I can do this better than you can okay, okay. Um, and then I was going to to mention the Photoshop things here's here's with uh, 35 millimeter telephoto lenses well we're all 35 millimeter now well, we're not either. <laughs> big uh, full-size sensors are 35 millimeter, but I'm sure he's changed his card now. But here's a card that, that uh, figures depth of field for uh, telephoto lenses. Uh, here's a card that, that uh, uh, gives you black and white filter applications, which I used to use a lot of in, in my black and white work back when we were doing uh, film. Uh, and uh, so forth. So go to photoshop.com. You'll find a lot of aids that will look interesting to you. And I don't know of any of them that aren't good. You know, that they're, the, the guys really got to. Uh, and before we go too much farther, I'm going to. to uh, See if anybody wants one of those. The lady that was asking me all the questions I could answer. <laughs> I'm sorry? You asked me the questions he could answer. You, you got that because I could answer your question okay. most of the time. Oh, okay. I'll ask you some more easy ones. Okay. This is fun. Right. I need to use one. I need to use this for my class anyway. There you go. Okay. Oh, no. You broke it. Oh, um, no. Now we, we've got plate balance. I think is about the only thing left on the on the page here. But uh, what's everybody doing about white balance? Are, are you setting the white balance to what you think it's supposed to set, or do you do all the Don't worry about it. There you go. Sometimes I forget. Yeah. I have used nothing but automatic since I got into digital and I see no reason to change. The cameras are that good in that particular regard that I don't see why I have to go dial up some imaginary thing unless I were a studio guy and, and knew the lumens or knew whatever you need to know to, to, to set, the, set it in a studio. 
Yes, because we have camp. One time I found it effective is in JPEGs and night shooting. When you're shooting at night, it does make a difference. But well, you I don't shoot a lot at night. You can correct it, but it's it's a lot easier just to do it in RAW. That's what I've been finding. Yeah. I just pick the color balance. Hmm. And well, only when I'm shooting at night. Depending on the light source at yeah. night. <laughs> and it's still never right. So. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, talked about that, talked about that. Um, I hate people that bring their equipment and play show and tell, but uh, there are some things that, that doesn't, doesn't really, you know, you like to recommend them and, and, and uh, if you haven't got a tripod, oh, I walked out again, didn't I? <laughs> uh, I've got more tripods than I, than I need, but nevertheless, uh, this one was the first one I bought, and it's heavy. It's got the ball head on it, and I would highly recommend that if those of you who don't have this kind of equipment yet, that a ball head is devoutly to be desired, rather than a head that, that requires that you do go this knob, and then this knob, and then this <laughs> knob, and so forth. This costs a lot more money because of the machining that has to be done on this ball right up here. But once you release that, you're going in all different directions uh, and, and you can <laughs> tighten it down right exactly where you want it. Uh, and it's, it's worth it. Just don't buy it from really right stuff. Their stuff is way too expensive. <laughs> but, uh, but it's really right. <laughs> uh, it's really right. It's really <laughs> right, yeah. And uh, Kirk, that's, that's who I bought that from. Uh, you, can, you can find Kirk.com, I think, pretty easily. Um, this happened to be a, uh, what do you call this stuff? Carbon fiber. Carbon fiber uh, that one of our camera members, camera club members, ordered a bunch of at one time, and it's, it, it was extremely inexpensive. Um, and it's, it's Faisal. F E I S O L, carbon fiber, this particular model, C T thirty four oh one. And boy, when you're going off the off the road, you gotta love it. Absolutely gotta love it. Yes, sir. What do you class as extremely inexpensive? I'm sorry. What do you class as extremely inexpensive? Hundred bucks? Well, well if it's extremely inexpensive, it doesn't have anything to do with camera stuff. No, I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> this, was um, this, this was relatively inexpensive. I don't remember now. This was so well like two under two or three hundred dollars. Okay, well yeah. under a hundred dollars. Right. You know, wow. whereas whereas the, the the big guys get three hundred, four hundred, five hundred for for their stuff. So is that F E I Z E L? This is. F-E-I-S-O-L. F-E-I-S-O-L. -S 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 and this particular model is CT-3401. I don't like this kind of, of, of uh, latch on, on, a, on anything, for that matter. You never know when you got it set right until the thing collapses on you, and you know, then your camera's down in the mud. Uh, I, I devoutly appreciate the uh, levers that are on these others okay and this comes in real handy too this this was who found this Kent somebody found this at, at, Walmart. at uh, Walmart his bond was yeah because he left his tripod at the Grand Canyon. yeah that's what it was <laughs> found it on a road trip because he needed a tripod and I don't know this was like 14 bucks something like that at, at Walmart and there's nothing wrong with it you know you know I need to put a head on it but well now they I, I bought one somewhere that had a swivel had oh, a swivel head on it mm -hmm. had a ball with a swivel and it was less than 30 bucks and all right. Sharon uses it you know when we go out yeah yeah because if you can't right. if you can't get a tripod in a place uh, you can use one of those yeah Okay. Uh, I don't know if Japanese starting to let you want to modify. Another another thing that uh, 
that you might be interested in uh, is even you know, most of what I shoot is 100% you know, of what I shoot is outdoors. I don't do anything else. But I love to shoot wildflowers and have for years. And the problem with wildflowers is you're out there in the in the sun and you've got the, 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 the drastic shade and the, the, you know, the washed out color and so on and so forth. So this can this can reflect or it can diffuse either way, just to however, however it rotates to the sun. So that you can you can diffuse all of that, you can create a little little diffused shade over a wildflower and it just saturates the color right up. If you put it in the right place, it helps block the wind too. Well, yeah, <laughs> the wind and the sun are going the same way. <laughs> That's a super deal. That's why you carry two. What were you looking at? Oh, that is light disc photoflex. Everybody sells them. Yeah, and there's several of those. I don't, I don't know whether this is the less expensive or, or not, but this hey, is, do you have a trick for if you're going by yourself for propping that up? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it is a trick. It's a, I mean, it's, how do you well, do it if you're going by yourself? You promise you won't tell anybody. That's going to remote your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly my wife. He, he wouldn't be alone then, would he? <laughs> uh, what I do is I take my tripod over there and I lean it up against the tripod. Or I hold it on with a clamp to a tripod, or I hold it on to a bush with a with a with a clamp yeah. or, yeah. or something yeah. like that. Or remote shows, shows and so you know, yeah. 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 And then get out and hand hold what what I told you not to hand hold. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you remote that too? All right. What? Uh, yeah, you could use one. Filters. <laughs> Filters were a, were a common nightmare in uh, film photography, I think. It, it blew me away. I didn't know what to do. But, and I only can only tell you what I do now. And, and you know, the old saw back when I got started was that you ought to put a filter of some sort on the end of every lens because it protects the lens. And I didn't do that for some number of years till I dropped a lens. And I uh, had to pay the guy out in a large settlement a great deal of money to get him to, to fix it. So from then on, I have a filter on every lens and it's a circular polarizer. You know, since I don't do black and white film anymore. I don't drop my camera. Anymore. Well, that's a <laughs> smart thing, smart thing. Gee whiz, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Uh, but I can highly recommend that, and of course, the, the, the colored filters anymore. I don't, you know, there's there's uses for them, but I, they're not very common. I don't think. Has anybody used colored filters in their, in their stuff? Okay. Okay. And neutral density and graduated neutral density uh, filters do have a function. Uh, particularly graduated neutral density, uh, where you can darken a sky uh, without darkening the, uh, the landscape in front of you, that kind of thing. Graduated neutral density. It's square as a general <coughs> rule, and you put it into a, a, a mounting bracket that, that then mounts to the, to the uh, camera so that you can then twist it uh, side, or clockwise or counterclockwise and it's in a slot so that you can lower it to the position that you want it lowered to so it works out pretty well. So that's another thing. Um, we talked about the cheat sheets from, show to, from a photo sharp. The other thing is shutter cable release. Now that, now that you're on a tripod you need a cable release. Yeah, I'd use a filter for that. And I have one. Yeah, I use one. I have to. <laughs> the polarizer. <laughs> yeah. But no, that's a neutral density. Is it? Yeah, but pin stops. I don't know that we've asked, answered all of your questions, but I hope we've answered most of them anyway. Pin stops. And I appreciate you guys. No.
it's it's just full ten stuff. If there's any more questions, if anybody got anything else you want to ask, last chance. Let's see what you're saying. It was a bright sunny day. Thanks for coming. Ken's going to do a. Wait, there's more. What are you going to do? Hyperfocal distance. Hyperfocal distance. Oh, I'm not here without confusing. Yeah. You're explaining the speed in uh, Star Wars, is that what you're doing? <laughs> while, while Ken's doing that, one, one more of my toys. Uh, this is a 12 volt uh, gizmo that goes in your car and changes 12 volt to 110 and you can now uh, charge your batteries as you're going down the highway. Oh, great. That's not an expensive item. Can you plug any, um, one, any, regular any, any regular household 110? Where did you get that? Because I'm looking for one. You had it's to ask me that. Yeah, they're everywhere. Walmart. 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 I think maybe I did get it at Walmart. Okay. How much yeah. money are we talking about? Right. Pardon? How much? You can spend I don't $15. Remember. It depends on the wattage. I, I, would, I, would, I would think probably, yeah. what, less than 30 bucks? Yeah, I would say. Probably less than 20 bucks. I don't know. but. You know, something like that. It rides in the back of my car now, and okay. you know, it stays there. Because yeah. I got things I'd like to plug in. Yeah. 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 <laughs> not in those. Not in that. Okay. Too much water. Too much water. Oh. <laughs> Be prepared to get for the, to, to uh, take some aspirin after this. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> when you focus your camera somewhere. Whatever aperture you choose is going to make the make your depth of field wider or smaller, right? Mm -hmm. And wherever you're focused, one third of that depth of field is going to be on your side of the subject, and two thirds of the depth of field is going to be on the other side of the subject. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I focus ten feet away and my depth of field is six feet. 10 feet to 8 feet is going to be in focus, and 10 feet to 14 feet, because the depth of field is 6 feet at the aperture I'm using, and a two-thirds of the depth of field is going to be past my subject, and one-third is going to be on this side of the subject. Okay? All right. You're taking a picture of a mountain, and you focus. You focus out here on the mountain. Now let's say your depth of field is 30 feet. 10 feet is going to be on this side, and 20 feet is going to be on that side. Okay? If, you're, if your depth of field has to be 30 feet at whatever aperture you're using at f4. Well, you got the mountain in focus but you only got 10 feet on this side and 20 feet of your depth of field is wasted because it's on the other side of the mountain. It's not picking up anything. All right. Let's say your depth of field, let's say you were shooting this at F11 and your depth of field is 100 feet. <coughs> and you focus here. Okay, you've got 33 feet on this side, and whatever, it's a 66 feet on that side. Now you're wasting 66 feet of your depth of field, and you've only got 33 feet on this side of the mountain is in your depth of field. All right. Let's say you focus here. And this is going to be at uh, uh, 30 feet. And your depth of field is 100 feet. Then your depth of field runs all the way from here to here. Now, this is an extreme example. But you see what I'm saying? Pretty so close. It, it, well, no, it's pretty <laughs> close. OK, let's say that's not about, let's say it's a person. And you want to get the flower and the mountains in, in focus. And you're using, say you're using a wide angle lens and you're at f11, with a wide angle lens at f11, your depth of field at f11 is going to be, let's say, a, a hundred, uh, 
210 feet. If you focus here, here, then 60 feet is going to be in front of your focus and 100 and whatever the difference, 140 feet is going to be away. So in order to get everything in focus, you need to focus not on the flower, not on the mountain, but somewhere in between. And that's the trick, is knowing where to focus. And the depth of field tables that Carrie was talking about will show you. The depth of field table, you choose your lens, because the depth of field changes with the focal length of the lens. You choose your lens, you choose the aperture, and you say, I want something from six feet to infinity in focus. So you look on this, it's got little arrows you turn. It says, okay, from six feet to infinity, you have to use F11, and you have to focus on 47 feet. That's the trick. Where's 47 feet? Is it here, is it there, is it there? I mean, and, and, yeah, and you can look at the back of your camera and, and, and use live view and zoom in. And I've been burned on this recently. I wonder if I got it all. You, you, you zoom in and you look on, the, look on the image on the back of the camera, it looks sharp to get home and you put on your monitor. It wasn't sharp. The, and that is the problem with the lenses that we're using today. Because the zoom lenses, two things. They don't tell you where 47 feet is. And they don't tell you what the depth of field is at their zoom because it would be so complicated we wouldn't be able to read it because there's so many variables. So I recently did a test <laughs> with my old Nikon AI lenses that I bought over 30 years ago against my new $1,900 Nikon zoom. And I tested them at 20, 28, and 55. And I set the zoom up at those, because the zoom does tell you what, what uh, length you're using. So you can set, I set my lens at 28, set the zoom at 28, and, and took a picture. Guess what? The old AI lenses were sharper. Just by that much. But they were sharper. And the neat thing about those old lenses, they have a depth of field scale right on the barrel. Remember those? Those guys that had cameras before? It used to say, it'll say, okay, at, at uh, the barrel look like this, that's a focal point, it'll say, it'll say 5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 8, uh, 8, 16, and there'll be marks. When you set your aperture, these marks are, this will be distance down here. This will be, it'll say, uh, 2 feet, 8 feet, 16 feet, 40 feet, 90 feet. So you can turn that barrel and you know that at what aperture, how long your depth of field is. So if you choose F11, it's good to two feet, and it's also good to 90 feet for this lens. And, it's, and, you, don't care, and you don't care where this more. This might end up at, at uh, 35 feet. You don't care where this ends up. You're just trying to match the points on that lens to cover the distance you need to cover. And it works. I just got back from Big Ben. I left those zooms in the car. Because I'm a landscape photographer, and I wanted as much depth of field as I could get, and I wanted to make sure it was sharp, and not find out when I got home that I blew it. And the lenses are not only sharper, but they have the depth of field built right into them. And so if you've, if you've gone to digital like I did, and still have your old equipment, <laughs> you might think about digging that out and running a little test with it. And if you don't have your own equipment, maybe you got a Canon or whatever you got, a Sony or whatever, you might go to KEH or the manufacturer. Nikon still sells fixed focal length lenses. I'll sell you mine. Yeah, and, 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 and I'm sure Canon still sells them, or you can go to KEH 
and you can probably buy a 50 millimeter, I know you can buy a 50 millimeter lens for almost any make of camera. It'll be a 1.8 for like 60 bucks. Because that, that was an easy lens to make there. The 50 millimeters are the sharpest lenses that they ever made because they were easy to make. So I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just suggesting that if you're worried about depth of field and you're a landscape photographer, you might, uh, if you're a landscape guy, you're probably going to shoot mostly at 28 millimeter lenses. I mean, that's, that's what I shoot. I mean, that's what I use most of the time for landscapes is a 28. So you might just buy one 28 millimeter lens from used and give it a shot and, and see, see how you like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, zooms have come a long way, you know, 30 years ago, you couldn't give me a zoom. They were right. terrible. They are really good now. I mean, well, I, when I tested them, the difference in the sharpness, and, and, and I did everything for sharpness. And I, I went to 100% on my monitor, and then I zoomed in from there. And I put them side by side, and they were so close. But I was going to see if the AI was even close to the sharpness of the $2,000 zoom. It was better. Just by a little, but it was better. So, yeah. something to consider. And if, if you're if you're worried about sharpness, let me get on my bandwidth. <laughs> Not only do you want to use a tripod, use a shutter release. If your camera has mirror lockup, use it because it prevents that that mirror. That, that's a piece of glass that's doing that, and then the shutter goes off. Well, the camera's still shaking a little bit from that mirror. If you can lock the mirror up and wait three seconds and then just the shutter goes off, it gives that little bit of extra sharpness. And then use a lens hood because that will, that will help you dramatically uh, in, in your image. And, and that's my problem now. I got these little, little fixed focal length lenses and no lens hoods. So I discovered from shooting a 4x5, I could take my cap. If I could see light on the lens, I'd hold it where the block of the light, that helped. So every little thing you can do to increase sharpness. But uh, if you can't do anything else, please use a tripod. Now, I judged uh, several camera clubs around, and camera clubs of people you would think would know better. And you can see, I got plain old prints, I'm looking at them. 60% of them had camera shake because they were handheld. Just no excuse for that. Why buy a $2,000 lens and avoid buying a $100 tripod? Does that make sense? I'm through. Okay. Okay. Anything else, folks? Let's go home. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.